We're pressing, we're going live, and I think we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Grad Chat from PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research, and that may be more difficult to talk about in our day-to-day. I'm your host, Faye Lin, and I'm a PhD candidate in biochemistry at UCLA. If you like what you see here, check out the PhD Balance YouTube channel for more grad chats, and don't forget to subscribe for notifications about when we go live. Now, PhD Balance just hit our third year anniversary, and our topic today is building a community around mental illness. And our guest is Dr. Susanna Harris, founder of PhD Balance. Susanna graduated from UNC at Chapel Hill last spring with a PhD in microbiology and immunology. Susanna currently works as the manager of engagement and communications at a life science accelerator called Zontogeny. And today, Susanna is here to talk about founding PhD Balance as a grad student in 2018, the PhD Balance journey thus far, and tips for anyone interested in building similar communities. So hello, Susanna. How are you? Hi, Faye. It's been so long <laughs> since I talked to you. I know. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I'm yeah. So it's excited. Uh... Uh, I, it's, okay. I know, <laughs> like our first grad chat was what, uh, it's getting close to a year ago, maybe 10 months or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's crazy because if any of you guys are scrolling through our YouTube page right now, our first grad chat <laughs> was me and Susanna just talking about all important things, yeah. mental health for an hour. And it was awesome. And check that out. And it's so strange because it has been like a year and now yeah. it's, PhD Balance's third year anniversary. And I feel like mm-hmm. so much has happened <laughs> since that time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think really like the way that we came up with doing grad chat is, is pretty similar to how all of PhD Balance came about, which was just like, oh, these conversations need to happen. And it's great to have them one-on-one with people who feel comfortable, but how can we extend those conversations out to other people? And how can we use this kind of like genuine back and forth to, to really normalize difficult discussions. And just like we've seen with grad chat where it's like you and I started it because we're friends. We talk about this stuff anyway, let's just talk about it more openly than like, let's bring in other people. And then you have become the host and are just killing it. And it's, you know, like that's to me, that's the most fun thing about building any sort of community or building any sort of project is to create something that you can then step back from and watch other people grow with, I mean, since, since we started it, you've changed how you videotaped these things. Like you've really perfected how the communication goes back and forth and even like the emails and there's a podcast now. It's just, uh, it's so cool. Like this is the most fun stuff I can ever think about, but yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, and I do have to say like all of this was possible because Susanna founded PhD Balance and created this team of people that was able to make projects like this grad chat possible because grad chat definitely is not a one person project. It is an incredible team that goes working on all the logistics behind the scenes. And it's amazing how that all came together and how we, I feel like we've come full circle a year later since like our first grad chat and now we're speaking about how, how much things have grown since then. And yeah. I guess with that, maybe we could jump in a little bit about the background on why did you found PhD Balance? Like what, what was the inspiration and how did that start? Yeah, I mean, kind of similar to how I do a lot of other things. It was a combination of being really excited, being pretty frustrated, and then also feeling like, you know, maybe I could create something that other people could feel as useful because I wish that it had been created for me before that time. Um, And I think that at least for me, when I'm building things, I try to focus it on one person. It's usually the easiest to think about, okay, what would past Susanna want? Um, And so all this ties together because in February of 2018, there was this paper that came out in Nature Biotech. And there were a few authors who what they did is they did a big survey of several thousand graduate students, the majority of whom were PhD students. And they looked at their signs and symptoms of anxiety or depression. And what they found is that at any given time, so at any given time when these students took this 
this kind of test. It's the same test you would get if you went to a doctor's office and they were wondering about your mental health. Um, of those people who, who did this survey, about 40% of graduate students were dealing with signs or symptoms of severe anxiety or depression. And I read this paper and I was like both very surprised, like kind of shocked. And also just, you know, I was sort of validated because I've dealt with chronic mental illness in a couple different forms for a really long time. And the year before reading that paper, so back in 2017, I had just an incredibly long, hard, depressive episode in grad school. Um, and I saw that stat and I was like, wow, this is really cool that I could turn to, you know, two and five people and say, I'm having this really, really hard time. And they wouldn't just say, oh, I'm really sorry. They'd say, oh yeah, I've gone through that too. Um, but then I was also really frustrated because I looked into the things and it turns out those stats aren't actually new. This wasn't like a breakthrough study of, oh my gosh, we had no idea. It's been decades of research. And why wasn't that brought up at orientation? Why, when I started talking about this, I had a professor say, oh yeah, I would say the majority of graduate students go on some sort of SSRI or other mental illness medication. I was like, why did you not tell that to people early on? And it was, we don't want to scare them off. And so I think that just having these conversations is, is so necessary. And I know that we don't want to scare people off. And I think a lot of times people see this work I do highlighting some of the issues with academia as, oh, well, you must hate it. That's, that's why you have all these issues with it. That's why you're no longer an academic. And it's like, no, actually, I think that academia can be just a fantastic place. It's a place that is hopefully a place for growth and how we teach people how to think as researchers, as, you know, people who are being creative. So why aren't we teaching people to take care of the organ that makes us think? Why are we don't focus on just how we're thinking, but how do we take care of that thinking? So all of that came together. I built, I decided that, Hey, let's have these conversations. Let's show the faces we see in academia, the smiling faces, the successful faces, the same faces we put on social media and underneath it, talk about dealing with mental illness. It was an Instagram page because that's sort of the format of Instagram. And it was called pH depression because I wanted to find maybe a hundred other people who dealt with depression in their PhD. And we could be friends and support each other through the end of our, at least out of my PhD. Um, and people, really wanted to share their stories and it just totally took off from there. But the original intention was just, can I find a handful of people that we can support each other and have these conversations? Yeah. I think you've said so many things that struck me in that. And one, I remember when this paper came out as well. And at that time, you know, I wasn't even on Twitter yet. I did not have the level of open dialogue that I do now around mental health. And I remember my reaction was kind of similar where it was just like, wow, this is kind of a something like I always knew I was struggling, but then it's like, wow, everyone else, this is a published paper saying that this is a documented issue. And that was really, I don't know. I, I don't want to say maybe it was kind of mind blowing because like part of this struggle is feeling so alone with mm -hmm. this stuff. And that's why communities like PhD Balance have been incredible in challenging that narrative that you're not alone mm -hmm. and that it's so important and valuable to share stories about things that are hard to talk about because then we go into this other layer of stigma that we have to challenge and all of these other issues that come with managing mental health. And so I, I really love this theme of, of sharing stories. And one of the questions we have here says, what was it like for you to start sharing your experiences with mental illness? Um, that's a good question. Uh, definitely scary. I, I'm hesitating because it's, it's still scary. It's still uh, every time you try something new. And even sometimes when it's the same, you know, story I've told or it, you're always telling it in a different way, in a different setting to a different audience. And so it's like, okay, to the friends or people I've already talked about my mental illness to, then it gets easier. But I could tell, you know, you and I could talk about something and I'd feel very comfortable. But if I went and talked to a colleague about it, that would be terrifying. So I, I think it still is, it is very scary. And it was, it like, it's not, it's not that I started talking about it because I wasn't afraid of it. It was sort of like, 
somebody has to do this. And I wish that somebody had done this for me. I wish that, and there's tons of people who do talk about this, but it wasn't, it wasn't in my face. It wasn't something that I saw. And so I figured there were spaces that could use more voices. Uh, and it was like, yeah, it's scary, but how am I going to feel if I don't do this? Um, and, and what is, you know, we, I think a lot of us go to grad school to try to make the world a better place, whether it's through science or sociology or, you know, changing paradigms. Um, and like, what was I using my space for other than to hopefully make things better for other people? So it was just a, yeah, it just felt like I was more afraid of, getting five years forward and thinking like, why didn't I say something? What, what did I miss out on? Um, and who might have needed to hear that the same way that I did before? Yeah, I, I definitely, <laughs> what struck me with that was the idea that it is terrifying. Like even now, as we're both pretty active people in public spaces talking about this stuff, I mean, I can speak about my own experiences that it's still kind of terrifying <laughs> to say yeah. something like hey I struggle with depression and put it on a, a you know a public platform and yeah. I think that's something that's important to share with people too that like mm -hmm. even at the point where you know PhD balance has grown into this amazing thing that's been super successful so much positive feedback over it I think it's still a scary thing for anyone to be open about vulnerabilities and our society can also do a lot of improving as far as stigma and all of these other things that maybe backlash that that make it very difficult to still be open about this stuff well and i think a, a big thing that you just said there is struggle like present tense um a lot of people are very comfortable with past tense stories of like oh this is you know so it's like people are are I, I share a video. It's um, if you look up the Monty M O N T I and then Susanna, you'll find it. It's a video talking about that really dark, depressive episode in grad school. Um, and so, but, but even though that's, I mean, that's definitely a content warning situation. Um, people are a little more comfortable with that versus saying, I still deal with this, you know, like there's still, and it's not, it's not pretty. I think there was, there was a tweet I saw recently where someone was like, yeah, we're all for destigmatizing mental illness until it's like, oh, I haven't brushed my teeth in two days. And then suddenly it's disgusting. And um, like, for me, the teeth brushing thing isn't really a thing, but it's more of like, oh, I haven't showered in 72 hours. Like I have now, but you know, that, that it's not, it's not something cute. It's not like when you're dealing with depression or you're dealing with anxiety, it's not sitting in a corner, drinking a cup of tea and being like, oh, I can't, I'm not happy about my movie. It's like being a kind of a shitty partner or like feeling terrible or having your whole body hurt or having basic human functions that you can't take care of anymore. And it's not, it's not what you see in cute movies. So I think it is, I mean, how do you, if, of course, I'm going to ask you all the questions, but like, how do you do it? How do you, cause you do talk about, you know, current mental illness and like, you have just done a fantastic job on Twitter of just speaking out and you speak about so many things, you know, how do you, how do you keep talking about these difficult things? And you run like the grad chats every weekend. That's a lot of work. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> you said so many nice things there. <laughs> so, oh. uh, um, yeah, it, it, I think, I think something that you said also made me remind, uh, reminded me about the context of academia as well, where it's a space where it is compared to, compared to, I mean, every, every space is different with its culture and, and difficulty being vulnerable. But I think in academia, there is a specific focus on accomplishment. So here are all the, you know, papers I've published and that there's a lot of like tying of self-worth into that. A lot of especially in academia that it was very rare to see these conversations and 
it kind of goes off of what you mentioned in the beginning about this is what I wish I saw when I was a beginning grad student or what I wish past face all <laughs> these conversations yeah. happen because I would have benefited so much. And that is definitely part of the drive. And then also realizing that just because I don't see these conversations now doesn't mean that there isn't a space for them or doesn't mean that this isn't, mm-hmm. doesn't belong here, that I can mm-hmm. create things that I see there is a gap for. And that is a really cool thing. I think that's what PhD Balance has essentially done. It's this space on open dialogue on mental health that was not there before, at least for, for me. I, I feel like PhD Balance was this first real, like at this point, international place where we can talk about these things and it's like wow it's grown and and now there's a precedent that we can create these communities or or Mm -hmm. I really want to make sure Susanna gets the the like full credit and uh really highlight (laughs) how she no 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 (laughs) no 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 um this would have stayed an instagram page it literally would have stayed an instagram page i had to bring on somebody to handle twitter because keep, people kept saying like oh this conversation is happening on twitter you need to be on there and i was like yo i'm not on twitter i had like 50 followers or something it was all people i knew from conferences i was like i do not want to run a twitter account i don't like twitter twitter is scary i don't like it there so i brought on somebody else that was my first team member um And, you know, then it was like, oh, okay, a team could do a better job. And then it was bringing on other people. Uh, And I think, honestly, that's to your point of uh, creating these spaces, creating these communities, maybe that's one piece of why it is it is really hard to do this, is that you have to trust other people that they're going to do as good or or better job. And the truth is, is that like you're saying, you know, you're hosting this, but like huge shout out to Linda. Oh my gosh. And also for her not being like, what are you doing? As I, I felt like a PI last night, you know, when a PI comes like you're for people who aren't in science, like your professor that you're working under comes in the lab and like starts doing science. And everyone's like, get out, get out of here. You have not been here in years. Get out because I just like kept messing everything up. Like everything I did, I was like, oh, I forgot that thing. Oh, I didn't post. Oh, I didn't log in correctly. Um, And so like shout out to Linda and Aiden and everybody on the social media team. People don't realize that there's always between 20 and 25 volunteers in this team. Um, So yeah, I'm just gonna like, I started talking, but nobody can keep going on their own. I just, I, I don't think anybody can be their own community. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is to start trusting that other people are just as passionate and just as committed and just as strong and capable as you are. And so rather than holding things away from them saying like, Hey, I made this thing. Would you like it? Do you want me to help you take it over? Um, yeah. You, we wouldn't have grad chat, man. We wouldn't be here if, yeah. if like we weren't like we met because the internet. We've met in real life, like we're like legitimate friends, uh, and we met because of both of us talking about this stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, it is incredible to see the connections that are made from just sharing stories, and I think that's. I mean, that was actually one of the big. Uh, hurdles for me in in starting I thought it would push people away and you know I I think in my experiences I've definitely you know unfortunately had scenarios with with that has happened because this is tough stuff to share and not Mm -hmm. everyone is going to be a, a fit for me to connect with over this but with that there's also an incredible team and community of people who respond so well and supportive and has ultimately helped my mental health and it was really eye-opening to see that I was just so afraid of sharing for the longest time I was missing out on Mm. a huge community of people that I could have connected with and that was something I had to learn (laughs) over time and got more empowered by after you know speaking more in these online spaces so I I think it's amazing community is amazing uh Uh. yeah. And 
I think an, another question that people are interested in for you, Susanna, is how did you deal with building PhD balance and doing a PhD? And how did you find balance? <sighs> uh, yeah. So um, I, I used this analogy last night when I did the Instagram takeover. And I, it is kind of how I think about it. Usually people think about balance as like you're being perfectly still, or maybe you're like standing on a balance beam and it, you know, you, you're carefully, you've got your work, you've got your life and you just kind of keep it perfectly there. I think about it more like a tray with a marble on it, you know, like you've got, you've got your tray. It's like, hopefully, hopefully a large tray. I think that's about having resilience. It's like having a nice big tray that you have a lot of bandwidth to kind of tilt around. And so maybe sometime you need to tilt towards more work. And sometimes it's more of like rejuvenation, more of like your creative passions, but either way, like your job is to make sure that that marble doesn't roll off the tray. And so, you know, you've got a lot of stuff to do. You're not just standing there watching your marble. And I think that that's the only way to be perfectly balanced in my opinion, is to stay exactly where you are. And I, for me, that's not very fulfilling. And I think that, um, you know, moving, changing, growing requires imbalance. It requires you to be moving and to adjust to that. But when we think about yoga or keeping that marble on the tray, it's about noticing when you're tilting too far. And it's about also accepting when sometimes your marble marble falls off or sometimes you tip over or something like that. It's about saying like, whoops, got to get that back together instead of, oh my gosh, I'm the worst. I should never do this. I can never do this again. I should just, I can't, I, I, there's, there's too many things I have to stop. I'm, I'm useless. Um, and so there's like a lot of that. And in terms of thinking about how I balanced a PhD and PhD balance, it was actually like, PhD balance is a lot of work. It's a lot of effort, but it wasn't the thing I had to be doing. And so it was part of my balance. It was okay. I can only, I can only do this much of my fun stuff, which is creating PhD balance, working with this team. If I also do my work and when I was tired and feeling unfulfilled my work, I had PhD balance. And when PhD balance became like a lot of stuff, I found friends and then that became its own rejuvenation. So I would say there's, you can't necessarily plan for it. Um, but a lot of this, a lot of my ability to do this was that I got medication. I still take medication. Um, and that keeps my mood up and balanced. Uh, and I know it works because occasionally I'll forget to take it. And then halfway through the day, be like, why is the world ending? Why is this the worst day that's ever existed. And I'm like, because <laughs> I skipped that part. Uh, but also I, I had an awesome therapist and just the biggest thing for me was being able to realize and not panic when I realized I was getting off balance. Uh, and, and I can't always do that for myself. And so like, I have a really supportive partner now. And to be honest, this week I was really struggling. Cause I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who I am. I just switched into this new job am I new? Am I, what am I supposed to be? And he was able to kind of talk to me a bit and he's like, I think you're having a really hard time. Could you take a day off? Like, what could you do? So it was seeing things as a passion, but also building some self-awareness to realize like, Hey, at the end of the day, nothing matters if I can't keep doing it. Right. So it's like, I could have worked 72 hours straight in the lab, truly, um, I would have had to sleep in the lab, which I had done, but then it's not sustainable or like with PhD balance, I could create the best online everything, but then I couldn't do my other stuff. Um, and just kind of making that decision of how can I make something sustainable for the long run instead of perfect right now? Yeah, I really like your marble analogy. And I think that really, maybe maybe the word is like normalizes that you don't have to be completely perfect and not struggling with anything. Like, I don't think that's the goal. I don't think that's human. I think it's very human to deal with day-to-day -day struggle. And that that is normal. And I think oftentimes I can speak for my own narrative in my head. It's like, oh, I'm struggling with this. This is normal. I'm like all, all of this negative self-talk mm. around normal day-to-day -day struggle when in reality I like this idea of like 
you know, my marble's still on the tray, <laughs> right? It's rolling around. I got things here mm-hmm. and there, but I just got to actively check in with myself and, and see, you know, if I am struggling to the point where I, I might need some extra help with that balance or, or just a mm-hmm. lot of self check-ins and to really be kind to myself if there are normal day-to-day, day-to-day struggle. And mm-hmm. I really like how you highlighted how creating these communities can be very rejuvenating. And that's how it's maybe um, motivating or makes it easier to go forward with these projects because they're rewarding. And uh-huh. I think a lot of times, like, it is absolutely work and people are, can before starting, can be focused on, okay, this is a lot of work. How do I keep it going? But also checking in on yourself and thinking, well, is this going to serve me? Like, is this, mm-hmm. if it's going to be too much, can I take a step back? And all of those check-ins when you're doing these projects are so valuable. Something I've actively had to do as well, where sometimes it's hard to be in these spaces and you got to take a step back and that's absolutely okay too for your own balance. Mm-hmm. And with that, I think another question people had are what tips would you give to people if they wanted to build a mental health support community on a small scale, like in a university? Yeah. I, I mean, I think my, the thing that I've learned a lot is maybe before starting something or as you're starting something, see what already exists. Uh, I think that starting something is really fun, uh, but it's really difficult. And I think a lot of times people will say, oh, this needs to happen because it's not existing. And so I think what I found in PhD balance and speaking at a lot of universities is I would talk to the students and I talked to the faculty and they would say, oh, we really need this. We have nothing in place. There's nothing in place. No one is doing this. And then I talked to the administrative staff or the health support staff, and um, they'd be able to point me to a whole bunch of different things. And it was like, oh, okay, well, there's clearly a need. This is not me saying there's not a need here, but I think looking around and seeing what is already there and why it's not being used. Maybe it's just not known. Maybe it is, hey, these are in-person workshops that are aimed at undergrads in the student health and no grad students are going to go. Maybe it's the timing. Maybe it's, it could be so many different things, but figure out really what that need is. And then find a little team of people who share your goals. Um, You have to be specific. Everybody is going to tell you to expand. You're never going to have so, so perfect an idea that you don't have people coming to you and saying, oh, you should do this. Oh, you should do this. Oh, you should get involved here. And so I would say first and foremost, you know, figure out what's, what exists and figure out what you want to do, figure out what your mission is, figure out what your vision is. And so like PhD balance, as soon as I said, I'm like, oh gosh, I'm going to mess this up in some way. But PhD balance is dedicated to creating spaces for graduate students to learn through shared experiences. And it's sort of vague, but it actually limits us in saying, you know, is this new project about graduate students? Is this about creating spaces? Is this about having conversations? And if it's not, we don't do it Uh, because you're going to start this thing for, hey, this needs to be for STEM graduate students. And someone's going to say, well, if it's science, tech, engineering, medicine, well, it should really include the medical students. And well, why not the the nursing students? And maybe, maybe not grad school, maybe it's just all students. And suddenly you have something that is completely useless and it's not sustainable. So kind of start to figure out what you want, find other people who can help you narrow that down, but are willing to say, we are blocking out this space in our lives to create this particular thing. And if you do that and you start at that really good, like origin point, you can expand and it can be sustainable. Um, So yeah, figure out what's needed, figure out what your aim is, and find a little team to help perpetually move that forward. I love that. It sounds like, you know, having a, having a vision, having an outline of going yeah. forward and is super important. And I think one of the follow-up questions here is what is the best thing that's come out of PhD balance? 
Oh, definitely friendships. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, but like, I, I, I feel a little guilty saying that because it's like, oh, it's all about me and my friendships. But um, it's, it's also not just my friendships. I think one of the coolest things uh, that happened really early on was that two people who had shared their stories on PhD Balance that were living in totally different places, but they were both, uh, um, I think they're both from Portugal, but one was in Brazil, happened to be in the same place at once, had known each other, had learned of each other through PhD Balance and like met up because they were friends now. So actual friendships and actual people supporting each other. And it's so cool to talk with people and say, oh, you know, you, you should talk to this person. And they'll be like, yeah, I already talked to that person because I met them through PhD Balance. Like, what what are you talking about? Why would I not know that person? So I think it's that that real sustaining community. And just like with everybody else, like I have built a lot of really great friendships um, with people because of talking about this. And to your point of when you start talking about this, you definitely do push people away. It was it's really surprising, at least to me, the which people you push away because some people who some people like when you might be struggling and it's not, it's not that they're bad people. It's just that that is the capacity that they know you in. So I think about in college where I drank way, 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 way too much. Um, and when I started cutting back on that, some of my friends who are really good friends with me, when we go out every Wednesday through Saturday, we just didn't have as much in common anymore. And so understandably they were like, come on, come have fun. You're so boring now. Come have fun. You know, like I got some of that too. When I started talking about mental health, where it was like, come on, just relax. Like you're making too big of a deal about it. We all have struggles, whatever. Um, and so you end up pushing away people who might be uncomfortable because it's just an uncomfortable topic, but you end up being surrounded by people who are comfortable talking about it and do want to see you grow and are like, yes, talk about your therapist. Tell us about the medication you're on. Like, let's do this. You're having a bad day. Me too. Cool. Let's get on a Skype call and watch a movie together because we understand each other. So I think, yeah, it's those friendships that like with people who I identify with who challenge me to be a better version of myself, who aren't afraid to say like, Hey, I'm noticing you're a little bit scattered. Um, and who I just feel like I can be myself around. Yeah. I've met so many great people through PhD balance and it's, it's really cool because I think about my like in-person relationships, like in my local environment. And then this PhD balance, like online community. And it is, it, it is hard to find your people in general. Mm -hmm. And when you are, this is what I've noticed, like in my local environment, there might be a limited amount of people who can connect over these things just because, you know, it's just a smaller, smaller pool of people. But then what's right. really incredible is that PhD balance, you, you like cast a net, right. All over, all over, all over the internet essentially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, and then you find all of these people all over the world that I otherwise would not have connected with. And that is so rewarding because it's, it, it is hard to find your people when you have a limited mm -hmm. amount of space to go through. So casting that net, I think was incredible connecting with people in places that I otherwise, I don't know if I would have even interacted with. Mm -mm. didn't we bring this up like in our first discussion first or second there was that maybe maybe it wasn't this but there was that tweet forever ago that was talking about you know it's like you can't just go outside and scream about how much you love cats and find a bunch of people who love cats but you can go onto twitter and be like i love cats and mittens and you're gonna find 40 other people who are like here's 20 pictures of cats and mittens that i keep on my phone at all times like you could, you, I can go out and say, I'm a microbiologist who deals with depression and anxiety. And I'm going to have a handful of people like, yeah, me too. And like, where else could I do that? Um, I don't know. That'd be a very strange party, but uh, you know, that'd yeah. be pretty cool. No, exactly. And I think it's really eye opening too, because I remember before I was on Twitter and maybe working in local student organizations trying to get the conversation going. And it did feel discouraging when there wasn't as much positive feedback or support for it. And not because it wasn't important, but again, because 
there was just a smaller set of people that I was, I was talking to and not everyone is going to have this full passion that, mm-hmm. that I did, which is, you know, very normal thing that I also had to learn to deal with and not everyone will provide the support I'm looking for. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and what was really eye opening, I think was going to the online space and seeing, connecting with so many people and that these people are out there with shared experiences. You know, that is one of the goals of PhD Balance to share, you know, for grad students co- to connect over shared experiences. Yeah. And I realized that there are my people out there. And I guess for anyone interested in building these communities, if it's at your university or, or wherever you're working, don't be discouraged and that there are people out there and sometimes you just have to cast a, a wide net for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have to think about like, what would you engage with? Right. Because I mean that sometimes people would ask me, Oh, I want to, I want to build this once a week support group for like this department. And it was just one of those things of, I don't really know how to build that because I wouldn't go to it. And it's like, everyone needs something different, right? Like for other people, they don't want to be chatting with people on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And that's great. Um, but think about really build it, build things for either yourself or for other people that you like think of a character of a person of like, who are you building this for and why would they enjoy it? And so it's like, if you're aiming towards introverts and you're trying to get them together in groups of 50, it doesn't matter how great the rest of everything is. You're not going to get that group of introverts or, or likewise, like with extroverts and saying like, okay, we're all going to do individual. You're not going to interact with people. Um, And so with like mental illness, it's, you're dealing with people who depends on the week, if they are mentally and emotionally able to do something, and then they end up feeling guilty about not going and they'll never show up again. So like, how do you think about the people that you're trying to serve and try to figure out their barriers to entry and why, like why something might not work. If you notice that something isn't working, just being kind of empathetic. And instead of being like, Oh, it's because I'm horrible at this. Just be like, yeah, maybe people feel bad because that's the headspace they're coming from. Yeah, I love it. And we're running out of time for this grad chat. And it has been awesome. (laughs) And if you have anything in addition, Suzanne, that we didn't touch upon in this chat so far, anything you want to touch upon? Um, Yeah. And um, this is something that one of my friends, and now she's your friend, uh, Neba Nirmal, um, she and I met, she, because of talking about mental illness and struggle in academia. She was a grad student at at Duke uh, while I was at UNC and we just got together and chatted and now we're really, really good friends. But one of the things that she brought up um, when I was telling her, like, I'm just getting really, really worn out and I'm just tired of constantly trying to like make things better. And she said, you can only, you can only fight for so long without recharging. And she talked a lot about like what you're saying, finding your people and finding people who can catch you when you fall down and re-energize you and rebuild you up. Um, And so I would just say, just don't try to be an island. It's not good for you. It's not good for the people around you. It's not good for the people who are supporting you, finding others who you can lean on and that you can help take care of is just it's such a great experience and it just makes, just makes so many things better. So find, find people that you can lean on who want to see you succeed in the ways that you want to succeed. Uh, and, and also accept that it's, they're not hanging out with you. They're not supporting you out of pity. They actually are enjoying being around you. So just kind of learn to accept that your presence is, is valid and is appreciated and is important. I love that. And that actually ties into this, this one question we just got in the chat, which says in the Middle East, it's really hard to find motivated individuals. Plus it's harder to stay consistent once you have started. What is the best way to ensure that we keep working towards it? Um, I think... 
setting little reasonable goals um, and readjusting what we think is reasonable. I think <laughs> I am a, I'm a fan of to-do lists and I'm also a fan of somehow n- never knowing how long it takes me to do something. It's amazing. I'm like, I'm 28 years old. I still don't know how long it's going to take me to write this email or do this thing. I, so give yourself the space. Um, but I think a lot of times when we say, uh, you know, I'm not keeping on top of this or I'm unmotivated, it's usually a sign that we're doing too much and we're asking ourselves or others to be more than human. Um, there's this really interesting um, kind of phrase that's embedded in DBT, um, dialectical behavioral therapy, and it's everyone is doing their best and everyone can do better, but nobody can do it alone. And I think that that's so important is that like, first trust you and that the other person is just doing their best, whatever their best is. No one is aiming to do less than their best, but your best looks very different across the day, across a week, over an entire year. So everyone is doing their best. Everyone can be better. It's not a judgment of like, oh, you mean I should be, but you, I, you shouldn't be better. I don't care. It's, it's for you, but you can Anyone can get better in a whole bunch of different ways. You define what better means and they define what better means. And finally, that you can't do it alone. So if you're trying to stay motivated or if you're trying to find people who are motivated um, to just keep putting in work, I would say really reevaluate if the expectations are reasonable and don't do it based on what should be reasonable, but just like, okay, what, what is the reality? What can I expect? What can I ask for? Um, And try to make that sustainable by building a a space where people can lean on each other when they might, when their best might not look like the best version of their best. Yeah. I think themes of resilience are super important here and also just normalizing it's hard to build a support network. And I think one of the lessons that I've had to learn over time is how to support myself in situations Mm -hmm. where there may not be other people around, not because I'm not worthy, not because of other negative things that I would tell myself, but just because people are human. And sometimes it's a very normal thing where other people may not be around, may not have the bandwidth, et cetera. That has mm. nothing to do with my self-worth or my worthiness or all of the other negative things I would tell myself. But <laughs> it, it is just so important to just trust that you are you are worthy. You can also support yourself and also that there are other people out there for sure and that it is can be challenging to find them and to build that network but you absolutely deserve it and Mm -hmm. it is super important that you you support yourself and just remind yourself that you Mm -hmm. are worthy Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh you know my my therapist I'll I'll end it on this which is that my therapist at one point said you know, do you think you're worthy of love and support and people liking you? And I was like, I, yeah, yeah. Like I do a bunch of stuff, like look at all this stuff. And she was like, no, if you did absolutely nothing, if you did not produce anything, would you still be worthy of love and support and kindness? And it was like, uh, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to, remember or believe that, but I think it's a good, it's a good practice to, even if it doesn't feel that way to remind yourself that like you are worthy of respect and love and support and understanding. Um, and how you're feeling at that moment is not a reflection of the reality of those things. Like sometimes our brains are really mean to us. And so it's okay if it doesn't feel that way, but I'm going to tell you, everyone should be telling you that that you're worthy of all of those things. I love it. It was that's such a great note to end on. Everyone, you are absolutely amazing. Everybody out there is absolutely amazing. <laughs> and yep. I guess we're gonna wrap up this grad chat from PhD <laughs> Balance. This has been awesome. If you're just 
tuning in for the first time, don't forget to subscribe to the PhD Balance YouTube channel for notifications about when we go live. And you can check out our other grad chats on our YouTube channel as well. Mm -hmm. So again, we talked all about the amazing efforts of PhD Balance. I also want to highlight we now have a speaking team. So you can go on the PhD Balance website and check out our team of amazing speakers where we offer services ranging from seminars, workshops, and more if you're interested in bringing these mental health conversations to your university, organization, etc. So I think the link is below. Please check us out. And PhD Balance is awesome. I met so many great people and Suzanne is awesome. Everything's Eek. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna go. <laughs> Bye.